Man, I've got a story for you. I'm a bit of an outdoorsman and enjoy a good camping trip when I can make the time for it. It was a few years back now, in the beautiful wilderness of Washington's Olympic National Forest. I had some unexpected time off work, and I decided to fill it with a solo camping trip. I had camped solo years ago, but it had been a while. Normally I go with friends or with my wife, but she couldn't take the time off work for this one. I don't think she was too thrilled about me heading into the woods by myself, but I told her I would be fine. Still, sometimes nature throws you things you just can't plan for, which is more or less what happened to me. I arrived at my camping spot on a Friday. My plan was to stay in the woods for an entire week. I remember it was comfortable summer weather. There was a little bit of rain in the forecast, but nothing I was worried about. So I started setting up a comfortable base camp where I could relax for the rest of the day. I've always admired the raw beauty of that place. I swear Washington has some of the greatest outdoor scenery in the world, and I was there for a week to enjoy it. That Saturday I decided to do a bit of exploration. I had heard about an abandoned logging camp nearby. I have an insatiable curiosity for all things history, and this was right up my alley. You know, there are people whose hobbies are searching for these old camps and abandoned towns. There's quite a few old ghost towns littered across the Mountain West, mostly Montana and Wyoming, but we still have some interesting finds out here. And I was excited to explore what I could. Early in the morning, equipped with a handy map and a few snacks, I made my way into a less traversed area of the forest. I trekked for a few hours towards this forgotten camp, unraveling the trail as nature intended. It was tough going for a while and I had a few tricky water crossings, but eventually I reached the place. It was so deep in the forest that you'd totally miss it if you weren't specifically looking. The place was eerily silent. A lot of it was overtaken by nature's vines and mosses. Abandoned wooden buildings were struggling under the weight of time. There were a few that still stood, but most of the campment had collapsed long ago. You could still see the foundations of the buildings, though. Tree saplings were sprouting through the rotting wood structures, and wild brambles gripped the crumbling walls with an uncompromising embrace. I couldn't help but marvel how nature had seamlessly embroidered its narrative within ours. There were a few tools left behind. Odd, I thought. It was like everyone just suddenly left and didn't bother to pack up. There was a rusty saw abandoned near a fallen tree trunk, and the wheels and yoke of a cart left outside of one of the buildings. I found a hammer and a hand drill. As I ventured further, the ambience changed perceptibly. Unfamiliar sounds echoed in the distance, like a rumbling beneath the earth. I didn't quite know what to think, but I guess I just figured it was something normal in the woods. But as the seconds ticked along, my feeling of unease grew more pronounced. An inexplicable sense of being watched enveloped me, every hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Little did I know, there was a surprise waiting for me, one that I was definitely not equipped to handle. As I looked around the camp in detail, I started noticing a peculiar arrangement about things. Fallen logs, seemingly haphazard to the ignorant eye, looked to be meticulously placed in patterns if you were looking the right way. The logs were massive. They couldn't have been moved by one person. There would need to have been a team, or even heavy equipment involved. More than a little unnerved, I continued to explore the area, but I kept my eyes out for anything worrisome. It wasn't long after I had discovered the pattern that something gigantic caught my eye. It was like a moving wall of fur between the trees. At first, I thought it was a bear, and that was enough to put me on edge. There's not a whole lot of creatures in the forest that scare me, but bears are something I'd much rather stay away from. I was starting to backtrack when I saw the creature move again. I couldn't believe what I had seen. Completely taken aback, I hid in some nearby bushes. What I saw could only be described as a living, breathing Sasquatch. In awe and a little terrified, I watched silently as it grabbed one of the logs and stacked it on top of another. It was unbelievable. The creature was like a mixture of a man and an ape. It was covered in dark brown fur, like a chocolate color. It had a very ape-like head and face. The only places I could see that weren't covered in fur were its hands and around its eyes. It was graceful as it walked, not making much noise at all, especially for a creature its size. Its arms hung low, 
Its hands reached its knees. It looked like it could likely walk on four legs too if it wanted, but it preferred to be upright. It grabbed another log and stacked it. I don't think it noticed me there and if it did, it didn't care. I watched it for a while from my spot in the bushes. It was clearly building something, but I couldn't figure out what. It would leave for a bit and then come back with another log. It was during one of those times that I decided to make a break, or it and run. I left the abandoned logging camp and didn't look back. I'll admit, I would have liked to have stayed longer and observed the creature, but I didn't want to press my luck. Looking back, the event seems rather surreal, an encounter right out of folklore. This experience has heightened my respect for the untamed wilderness and the undiscovered creatures that lie hidden within the forests in our parks. Hopefully we can manage to share the wilderness spaces with them and just go about our separate ways. Hey there, I thought I'd write in and share a tale that happened while I was out on a kayaking trip. Your show tends to deal with a lot of urban legends and strange happenings. And well, I reckon I've had an experience that fits the bill. I live in Springfield, Illinois, as run of the mill a place as any, but every now and then I get the itch to go off the beaten path. On this particular occasion, I decided to take a solo kayaking trip to one of the woodland rivers we have nearby. You can't really beat the peace and quiet of being out in nature, don't you think? The sun's just breaking through the trees as I set off on my kayaking trip. It's a beautiful day, truly. I got my supplies all packed, waterproofed the essentials, and went through the whole safety routine before I pushed off from the riverbank. My kayak glides through the water effortlessly, barely leaving a ripple in my wake. One of the best parts of these trips for me is the wildlife. The river cuts its way through the forest, and sometimes it feels like you're the only human around for miles. As I was paddling along, birds chirped above me in the canopy, and the sun cast long shadows on the forest floor. Further down the river, I spot a family of deer tentatively taking sips of water at the shore. I stay as quiet as I can, not wanting to startle them. I feel content, calm, everything's as it should be. The first oddity strikes when I notice that the woodland noise has fallen eerily quiet, like someone's hit the mute button on the world. Didn't think much of it, figured maybe a predator was nearby, so I keep paddling, but it kept nagging at me. All of a sudden, a shiver runs down my spine. You know, that feeling you get when it seems like you're being watched. I stop my paddling, stay still, looking around, trying to figure out what's setting my instincts on high alert. And then, in the bleary after sunset light, I see something unusual on the riverbank. I first notice a strange shape, tall, substantial, and shadowy. I squint, try to make sense of what I'm seeing. Whatever it was, it didn't belong in this world. It was neither human nor animal, like a silhouette that didn't fit into this tranquil landscape. Now, if this were a fishing story, I'd probably be talking about some giant fish. But out there on that peaceful river, that's where this unidentifiable creature made its entrance. But that's a tale for another time. To be honest, I've been doing very much like what most of us do when things get weird. I keep it to myself, put it at the back of my mind and try to keep moving. But now, maybe it's time to share. I mean, weird stuff happens all the time, right? Sometimes there aren't any explanations. And this, my friend, is one of those times. So, I was right in the middle of the river. It had started to darken now, sunset blazing in the skies above. I've seen a lot of wildlife in these parts, but whatever I saw that evening, it didn't seem quite right. You've probably had moments like these, where things appear strange or out of place. And there it was, this disproportionately tall figure standing on the bank. It was too distant to make out clearly, but there was something bat-like about it. It appeared to be standing on two legs, but was taller than any critter I've ever seen around here. The edges of its body seemed to flutter subtly with the evening breeze, hinting at what looked like wings, and it didn't move from its post for a good few minutes. In retrospect, I couldn't understand why I didn't take out my camera. Noticing it fully wasn't the problem. It was understanding what I was seeing that was harder. I wasn't sure if it was the fading light playing tricks on my eyes, or if there really was something there. The boat wobbled under me, 
as I reached for my binoculars without taking my eyes off the figure. The sight that greeted me through the lenses was unexplainable. The figure was closer now, almost human like with a body about six feet tall. What I mistook as fluttering fabric were large leathery type wings folded behind it. But what really threw me out of the loop were its eyes. They were reflective, large red eyes, almost glowing in the deep of the evening. Without thinking, my hands slipped and the binoculars plunged into the water with a splash. The creature looked at me then, releasing an almost unnoticeably soft chirr before it disappeared into the thicket. My mind was racing. I was swept up in a mixture of fear and bewilderment. My arms ached from the sudden jerk of the paddle as I fervently rowed away. The serene river from the afternoon was now poisoned by the eerie encounter. I tried to make it back to the point where I left my car, while the remnants of the day's light were on my side. Halfway there, I considered dumping the kayak and swimming back, but somehow I made it back. Since then, my perspective on nature has undoubtedly changed. It's not just a place of tranquility anymore, but a realm of unanswered questions, a domain where the unexpected thrives. That figure is still etched in my memory. Was it a trick of the shadows that my tired mind fell for? Or was it something unfamiliar that my brain tried hard to label? I often found myself wrestling with these questions. Sometimes we can be so taken in by the rhythm of our mundane lives that we forget the vast expanse of the unknown that still exists out there. I'm sure this story might fuel some fascination in your show's followers. The world is full of unexplainable phenomena. And to be honest, encountering one myself has only sparked my curiosity rather than deterring me from my adventures. Thanks for listening. And if any of your listeners have any similar stories to share, I'd love to hear them. So I want to share a story. It's not your everyday tale. And to be honest, there's not much about it that you could call normal. It happened two years ago, in the heart of summer. I found myself hiking through the Appalachian Mountains. There's nothing that can quite match up to the sheer rugged beauty of those mountains. But beauty can hide things. Dark things. It can cover up the strange, the bizarre, and the downright terrifying. To tell you the whole truth, I hadn't planned on a solo hiking trip. It had been a tough few months preceding that little escapade, and I was in desperate need of a change. I was tired of the city, tired of the noise, and tired of people. I was craving solitude, adventure, and a bit of a challenge. I figured I could achieve all three of those out in the wilderness, and the Appalachian Mountains seemed as good as any place to find it. There I was, with a week's worth of food in my rucksack, my camping gear, and not much else. There's a kind of freedom in simplifying your life down to the bare essentials, and I was loving it. The first few days were nothing short of amazing. I explored the beauty of the mountains and made my camp wherever the sun found me at the day's end. I relished the isolation, the peace, the quiet. Solo trips weren't normally my thing, but I was so glad I went. On my third day into the trip, the trail led me to this secluded area adorned with tall trees and a steep cliffside. Tucked into the side of the mountain was a hidden cave entrance, partly camouflaged by the thick foliage around it. I've always had a thing for caves. The dark, the mystery, the unknown, and the chance to explore something that few, if any, other people had seen before. I know it probably wasn't a good decision to go alone, but I decided to check it out anyway. I unpacked my headlamp, pocket knife, and strapped on my hiking boots. While making my way toward the cave entrance, the familiar sounds of the forest seemed to silence. No bird songs echoed, no rustle of leaves from darting squirrels. Everything was quiet, and eerily so. Pushing the unease aside, I shrugged it off as just the echo from the surrounding mountains. As I breached the threshold of the cave, I was met with a gust of chilling wind that was out of place in the warm weather. My headlamp pierced through the cave's darkness, casting long, distorted shadows upon the rocky walls. Normally, I was down to explore places that were a bit frightening or macabre, but there was something about this place that made me worried. I ventured down into the cave a little further. The smell of damp earth grew stronger as I descended deeper. The walls were slick with moisture, and pioneer organisms 
that took advantage of the steady conditions. Caves can be tricky to navigate. You don't always realize you're in too deep until it's too late. After I'd been poking around for a while, my headlamp at its highest setting, I started noticing strange symbols littering the cave walls. It was faint, almost as if it was engraved centuries ago and weathered by time and elements. I leaned closer to catch the minute details of the symbols. The engravings were intricate, almost familiar, but nothing I could immediately identify. Suddenly out of nowhere, a strange mechanical clicking noise echoed in the cave. My blood ran cold as I turned around searching for the source of the sound. What I saw then, in that fleeting beam of my light, shook every bone in my body to the core. The creature before me appeared almost human, or like something that used to be a human. It was thin and ribby. Its skin was stretched tight over its protruding bones. It was so pale it was nearly blinding. It had arms and legs like a human, but it didn't use them in the proper manner. It chose to crawl around like a golem instead of walk upright. Its large black eyes reflected the light from my headlamp. They seemed too big for its face. Its features were almost cartoonish, like it was something that just couldn't be real. And yet, there it was. As fear set in, the creature backed away from the light, still making that harsh clicking noise. I wanted to run, scream, do something, but I was frozen where I stood. In the strangest reaction I could have had, rather than running, I cautiously raised my hands in a gesture to show that I wanted no trouble with the creature. Part caution, part desperation, to my astonishment, the creature seemed to sense my intentions. I could swear that in that moment, I felt a connection with this wonderfully bizarre creature. There was respect and fear, understanding and the unknown, all in one. I couldn't speak with it, but it still seemed to understand. But I didn't want to press my luck. Carefully, slowly, and with all the calm I could muster, I walked backward, keeping both eyes on the creature until I was out of its sight. Once out of the cave, I turned on my heels and bolted, not slowing down until the cave was a distant memory. The rest of my hike was uninterrupted, but how do you return to normal after seeing something like that? Upon returning home, I tried to find answers, digging into folklore, into history, into science, anything that could explain what I had encountered. Was it protecting something? If it was, what was it? Those symbols on the cave wall came across my mind repeatedly, an itch in the back of my brain that demanded attention, but I couldn't find any information that helped solve my mystery. I've experienced things and met a creature that has left me with more questions than answers. And strange as it may sound, I find a certain beauty in it. The mystery, the chase, the thirst for more knowledge, and the realization that there is so much about this world that we do not know. I worked for a while in Kings Canyon National Park, and boy, do I have a story for you. Most people don't realize just how vast the park is, or even how wild and isolated it feels when you're on patrol at night. I'll be honest, it's that tranquil solitude that drew me to this job. When you're out here among the towering granite cliffs, the ancient sequoias, and the wild rivers, well, it reminds you of how small and fleeting our human worries are. Unfortunately, that peacefulness that I so often enjoyed in this place was about to be disrupted by an encounter that left me with more questions than answers. I was on my rounds. It wasn't too exciting. I was tasked with making sure that camping restrictions were respected, checking to ensure there were no adverse encounters with the local wildlife, and most importantly, keeping an eye out for lost tourists who might have wandered off track. That happens more often than it should. I'd been a park ranger for about a decade by then. I thought I had seen everything, but never once had I experienced anything that falls into the unidentified creature category. But as I was saying, I was driving my pickup along the park roads, occasionally shining my powerful spotlight on the dense trees to catch the ethereal glow of a deer's eyes or to spot a mischievous bear foraging in the undergrowth. Oh, the number of times I've had to shoo those brutes away from the campsites because of people leaving food out. It was ridiculous. As I was headed towards the Cedar Grove area, 
something unusual caught my attention. My radio had started to crackle with static. Now normally this wouldn't be completely out of the ordinary. After all, we're in the mountains, reception can be spotty. But this was different. There was a hum, a quiet, low-pitched sound that somehow managed to echo even in my truck's cabin. Almost like the sound you'd imagine a massive transformer would make. I initially brushed it off, assuming some kind of interference. But as I continued patrolling, I got this eerie sensation. You know that prickling you get at the back of your neck when you feel like you're being watched? That's exactly what it felt like. The trees seemed unusually quiet. Even the usually talkative forest night critters were noticeably silent. The only sound accompanying me was the humming static from my radio. I pulled my truck over for a moment, killed the engine, and just listened. A momentary gust of wind rustled through the leaves nearby, but other than that, the silence was stifling. I felt the hair on my arm stand on end, and that's when I saw it. It was a flicker of light within the trees. There was something odd about that light. It wasn't the warm yellow of a camper's fire, or the bright beams of headlights or a flashlight. It was a cold, luminous blue, odd and completely out of place in our earthly woodlands. The hues shifted and twisted in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It was as if I was looking directly at a bright star, but it was right there, in the middle of the park, and heavily shrouded by the sequoias. Intrigued, or maybe it was my ranger sense of responsibility kicking in, I decided to investigate. After all, mysterious light sources in a national park aren't really within our recommended list of recreational activities. Leaving my truck behind with my radio attempting to break through the relentless hum, I ventured towards the mesmerizing light. As soon as I moved beyond the clearing, the glow got brighter, illuminating the foliage around me. It was like something straight out of a Spielberg movie. My eyes naturally squinted in response, trying to make out the source while also avoiding the blinding glow. The eerie hum got louder each step I took. Then, above me it hovered. A stretch of gray looming overhead, shimmering with bands of strange, oscillating light. It had to have been at least 30 feet wide, maybe more. There were no definitive corners or edges. I wasn't quite sure what I was looking at. It just seemed to glide seamlessly into the air, like a piece of polished silver under the moonlight. Not a damn sound, too, other than that overwhelming hum, which seemed like it was resonating from deep within me at this point. I stood there. Too dumbfounded to be afraid, sort of numb really. I faced down a few angry bears in my time, and the anxiety I felt then was nowhere near the sensation coursing through my veins now. It was otherworldly, literally. In my trepidation, I managed to back out of the clearing, keeping my eyes on the object. It was static, like it had somehow halted the very concept of time in its vicinity. Then, as soon as I veered into denser forest, it took off, leaving behind not a trace. I didn't know whether it was safer to stay hidden or dash to my truck. This wasn't something we were trained to handle in the park services. This was so far beyond my understanding or control. After what felt like an eternity, the hum finally faded from my ears, and I dared to peek out behind the foliage. There was nothing, just the serenity of King's Canyon at night. It was as though the whole encounter had never happened. I took a few deep breaths, gathered my courage once more, and sprinted for the truck. I didn't breathe easy until I was safely back at the station. I spent the rest of my shift in a daze, huddled by the radio, trying to piece together what had happened to me. It's not something I'd talked about, not until now. People fear ridicule and people fear the unknown. And what I encountered that night was a combination of both. Some days I feel like I'd stumbled into an X-Files episode. Other days, I try to find logical explanations. Maybe a military craft I wasn't supposed to see, or the auroras playing tricks on my senses. But I've never really been able to convince myself. I know what I saw and heard, and although it churns my gut every time I recall those moments, I'm also oddly fascinated by them. I don't view the wilderness the same way anymore. It's not just the silence of the park or its towering sequoias that whisper ancient tales anymore. There's something else out there, too.
I live in the beautiful city of Salem, Oregon. In my humble opinion, it's the absolute best place for people who love to dive headfirst into nature. Even our trails have a certain magic about them. So, as part of my daily ritual, and for the sheer love of it, I trail run with my four-legged partner in crime. His name is Rusty, and he is a border collie who's just as adventurous as I am. And that's saying something. I swear that dog was born to run. He's got this kind of wild spirit that makes you fall in love with him instantly. This story I'm going to share with you, it takes place on a crisp, sunny afternoon. Honestly, the weather was so perfect. It's one of those days you wish you could bottle up for later. The leaves covering the trail in a rustic tone blanket. Rusty and I started off at our usual pace. Me trying to match his enthusiastic bounding with my steady jog. The rhythm of his yips and the crunch of leaves under my shoes were relaxing. It is during these runs that I feel truly connected with nature and everything around me. We were about halfway through our usual trail when Rusty's behavior began to change. This dog, who was always so full of life, seized up. His ears flattened against his skull and a low growl rumbled in his throat. It wasn't the playful growl I'd come to associate with him spotting a squirrel or a rabbit. It was more fearing, protecting, Whatever it was, it set my nerves buzzing. I came to a halt trying to catch what had alerted him. The trail was quiet, almost oppressively so. And I swear, even the air smelled different. Sickly sweet, yet metallic. Like the air in a room with too many electrical appliances. A whiff of something foul hit my nostrils, instantly making me wrinkle my nose. Dread settling into my gut. It wasn't natural, or at the very least... It was a natural smell that had no business being out here, where the only scents were pine, earth, and sometimes, Rusty's wet fur. Suddenly, as we stood there trying to figure out the rancid smell, a chilling howl echoed through the woods, sending a ripple of fear through my every nerve. I'd heard enough dog howls and that, that hadn't been one. It sounded strange, guttural, and off. I was about to move, to pull Rusty back to the trail we'd come along, but the creature that appeared out of the bush was quicker. In my gut, I knew it wasn't a dog. It was too big, easily towering over us at seven feet tall with darting demonic eyes that looked far too intelligent. It was covered in dense, matted hair, so dark it was all I could do to make out its features. Its body was a jumbled mix. The bulkiness of the chest and the wide set of shoulders looked human, but its legs were all dog capped off with overly large paws. It had a long snout carrying a double row of teeth that looked anything but friendly. A sharp, dangerous gleam accompanied those teeth and was the focal point of its grotesque face. The moment those eyes locked onto me, time seemed to slow. My heart pounded in my chest like a war drum and I felt a chill run down my back. Rusty was still growling, the deadly seriousness in his canine voice reminding me how real this was. Desperate, I stumbled backwards, pulling Rusty with me, my mind frantically looping on the thought of escape. It growled, the sound piercing through the air as it lunged in our direction. However, we were quick on our feet and managed to put a good distance between us and the creature. Escaping from what I now began to realize was something far beyond my comprehension. Even once we had made it onto the main trail, with the terror of the encounter behind us, it didn't feel real. It felt like a horrible twist of nature, a fiercely primal predator pulled straight out of a chilling horror movie. The absurdity of what we saw was so profound, it was hard not to second-guess my own memory. In the days that followed, I was left with the echo of fear and a newfound respect for the unexpected. Comparing our usual, peaceful runs to the frightful experience, I was reminded just how swiftly tranquility could morph into terror. A walk in the wilderness was never going to be the same. Moreover, Rusty's reaction has had me marveling at the power of a dog's intuition. I was left with an insane amount of gratitude for my four-legged buddy. If it hadn't been for his initial warning signals, I don't know how things would have turned out. So, Donovan, that's my strange tale. I'm still coming to terms with how a run in the woods turned into a face-to-face -face encounter with a creature that I can only categorize as what cryptozoologists call a dogman.
I'm not saying I'm a full-on believer now, but let's just say I've got a newfound respect for the mysteries of the world. And I don't take Rusty's warning signs lightly at all. I've been stationed at Badlands National Park for several years now. It's a good job most days. The incident I'm writing about took place last summer in mid-July, during one of those hot, near-desert-like days when the thermometer was pushing over 100. Badlands is quite an interesting place. It's a kind of wild, stark beauty carved out of the land. But then it's also this quasi-moon surface in some areas, full of rugged rock formations, sharp cliffs, and jagged spires. Working as a park ranger is an enriching experience. You get to see a different side of the world. It's quiet. It's serene. It's beautiful. There's something about the isolation that puts things into perspective and helps remind you why you signed up for this duty. But it's not always exciting. There's a lot of paperwork, liaising with tourists, and maintenance work to keep the trails and viewing areas in decent condition. And every so often, we get some fool who thinks it's funny to chuck a soda can off into the wilderness or start carving their name into our trees and rock. But you've got to love the job because there's no replacement for those breathtaking sunsets or the sight of wildlife in their element. I was on my usual rounds that day, checking the trails, making sure the trail signage was intact, observing if the animals were behaving normally, and unfortunately, also picking up the occasional litter left behind. I was on the Sage Creek Loop a good third of the way through, on the rise that gives you that really fabulous view across to the rock formations on the other side of the creek. It was approaching evening, and the critters were starting to hunker down for the night. And then I heard something. It was a strange sound, out of the ordinary. The best I can describe it was a low, guttural grunt, accompanied by a sort of knocking noise. The direction of the noise was more or less clear. It seemed to be coming from off to the west, down past the base of the hill. But what it was, well, that I couldn't pinpoint. But being out in the field, you learn not to jump at every sound. Things in nature can be unpredictable, and there's often a logical explanation for anything odd. So I decided to continue picking up some trash. Strange sounds or not, I still had work to do. Then I heard it again, but louder this time and more insistent. It was a deep, resonant growl, contrasting eerily against the peaceful silence of the park. Even the wind seemed to be holding its breath. At this point, I decided to shelve my cleanup task and investigate further. As I made my way down that slope, every sense of mine was on high alert, watching for any sign of movement or another sound to point me in the direction. But the world around me had gone strangely silent. Suddenly, I noticed a pattern in the silence. The animals were anxious, nervous even. They knew something was off. I saw unusual tracks on the ground. There appeared to be large footprints embedded deep into the earth. Almost human but bigger. Much bigger. And barefoot. I followed the tracks deeper into the wilderness. It was then I saw it. My heart froze as I took in the colossal figure standing tall and ominous, just a few feet away from me. It was massive, standing easily at about nine feet and adorned with dark brown, almost reddish hair that covered the majority of its powerful body. The creature had a pronounced forehead, wide nostrils, and a face that was a mixture of man and ape. Its features resembled those of a primate, but there was a human-like intelligence behind its eyes. They were deep set and dark brown, almost impossible to see in the fading light. There was something about its face, scarred and weather-beaten that told of its years in the wilderness. Before I could react, it produced this deafening roar, sending birds flying away from nearby trees. The sheer power of that sound was stunning, echoing throughout the deserted wilderness. The smell of the beast was equally shocking. It was a musty, pungent, putrid odor that seemed to clog my nostrils. With my heart pounding hard in my chest, I backtracked slowly, my eyes never straying from the ape-like creature. The silence of the forest was broken yet again by the creature's deep growl. It watched me as I slowly retreated, its deep-set eyes never leaving me until I was out of its sight. When I reached the trail again, alone but safe, I began to question my sanity. Was it possible 
had I indeed come face to face with the fabled Sasquatch. I reported the incident to my colleagues, but it was dismissed as a result of working alone in the wild in harsh conditions. They said my mind was just playing tricks on me in the changing light of dusk. However, the encounter had a deep impact on my life. Each rustle in the brush still arouses fear. Every unknown noise in the wild feels like a signal of impending danger. I'm no longer the same ranger who found solace in the isolation and serenity of the wilderness. Now, there's a lingering sense of fear, a tinge of uneasiness as I patrol the same trails. And I can't help but feel that sometimes, those deep-set eyes are still watching me from the shadows. Whatever creature I encountered that evening, it was a stark reminder of the unexplored and untamed wilderness that lies beyond our understanding. I'm still not quite sure what it was I encountered that sunny day in Asheville, North Carolina. It's the kind of place where you can't help but feel small, surrounded by vast open sky and the age-old mountains. It was perfect weather for a mountain bike ride. Little did I know, I was about to experience something that would deeply affect me. I've always been an adrenaline junkie, and mountain biking has been my poison of choice for a number of years now. There's just something so liberating about tearing down dirt trails, your heart pounding in your chest, your bike thrashing beneath you, and Asheville with its sprawling mountain ranges had always been on my biking bucket list. The day started just like any other perfect mountain biking adventure. I was pumped, my senses heightened, throttling down one of my favorite trails, a scenic ribbon of dirt and rocks and roots twisting along the side of the mountain. The trail followed the line of the mountain. It was a perfectly molded single track paired with breathtaking views. The sweet tang of pine, the cool mountain air, the sunlight filtering through the trees. It was exactly my definition of paradise. But then, something shifted. Have you ever had that feeling where something just feels off? That's exactly what it felt like. I took a break from my ride to take in the surrounding beauty and to hydrate. The sun was hanging low and the sinews of evening light were beginning to suffuse the edges of the sky. That's when I felt it. A creepy sensation prickling up my spine, an undercurrent of something not quite right. I shrugged it off as the setting day playing tricks on me and was about to mount my bike again when I heard it, a rustling somewhere behind the tree line. The rustling grew louder, more deliberate. The hair on my neck stood on end and my stomach churned. As a biker, I'm not a stranger to wildlife or their sounds. Yet this felt different. The rustling seemed to morph into a low, sickening groan that echoed around the subdued forest. An earthy, musky smell quickly followed. It was pungent and quite unlike anything I'd smelled before. It was almost nauseating. Stumbling backward, my eyes darted through the dimming woods to the source of the noise. There it was, or rather, there it wasn't. Nothing was visible. I could only sense the menacing outline of something indistinct, something existing mostly in my mind, fueled by my fear and its strange, heavy presence. The shadow seemed to come alive. Its presence seemed to show itself and then disappear. And yet, every nerve in my body screamed of its undeniable existence. I strained my ears, hoping to pick up any familiar sound that might explain the mystery. But what followed next was anything but familiar in the woods. It was a soft, eerie laughter. Unease swelled within me. I knew I wasn't alone, but identifying what was with me was trickier. My instincts told me to get the hell out of there, but my curiosity rooted me. With every passing moment, the events around me were getting stranger. Desperate to retain my sanity, I decided to confront it. Whatever it was. Standing tall, I called out. I tried to sound brave but my voice echoed back from the woods. What was happening? What was this unseen presence plaguing my adventure? And why did it feel like my life was about to change forever? Suddenly, a figure emerged from the dark veil of the forest, emanating an uncanny aura that was filled with dread. My breath hitched in my throat as I tried to make out the silhouette. It was tall yet unnaturally slender. Its body seemed fluid-like, shifting and twitching unnervingly. It had a peculiar gait that was both intriguing and terrifying. 
I felt like a deer caught in headlights as I squinted to get a better look. Trying to make sense of what I was seeing, a sudden flash of golden lights pierced the thickening dusk, its eyes glowing in a vivid shade of gold, bore into mine. Hanging in midair, they looked surreal, revealing nothing about the creature. It was then that I heard it, a sound so out of the blue that my mind struggled to make sense of it. An uncanny mimicry of my own voice repeating the words I had just shouted. My blood ran cold at the sound. It felt like the forest was whispering back to me in my own voice. Without thought, my body finally submitted to the rush of adrenaline. I yanked my bike off the ground, jumped back on, and pedaled away as hard as I could with the strange creature's gaze boring into my back. Not daring to glance back, I focused on the trail ahead, leaning into the bike and relying on my muscle memory to navigate the familiar terrain. By the time I broke out of the tree line and onto open ground, it was starting to get dark. I didn't stop until I could no longer hear the blood pounding in my ears, until a comfortable distance separated me from the strange presence I had left behind. As I look back at that encounter now, my memories are filled with unease and unanswered questions. Was it real? Was it a guardian of the mountains? Or an entity with more sinister motives? Obviously, I had emerged from the encounter unharmed, but I couldn't shake off the lingering sensation. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months. Yet the memory of that encounter kept me awake on most nights. Each time I rode my bike through the mountains, I could feel its unseen gaze upon me. I couldn't ignore the soft rustling of leaves, the unnatural sounds that echoed amongst the quiet mountains. For in the end, we are all just wanderers, getting lost in our adventures to find who we truly are. And hopefully we can all see what the world actually is. So, I've got a story for you that's sure to send some chills down your spine, no matter how cozy you might be feeling at the moment. This one is from my cross-country skiing escapade in Wyoming that I cannot seem to forget. This took place many winters ago, when I had decided to take off from work for a week and indulge in my passion for cross-country skiing. I love the solitude and the rhythm that you fall into, the sensation of being one with nature. Born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the local landscapes were my playground since I was a child. I remember setting off early that day. The sun was just shy of touching the horizon, and the pristine snow was untouched, the wind cutting against my face, the rhythm of the skis beneath my feet, and the faint crunching sound was all part of this winter symphony that I cherished. As I glided along my favorite skiing territory, I felt something different that day. The air had this particular chill, not the usual winter cold that I was acquainted with. It was eerie, a bit unsettling. Despite having traversed these paths for years, Something seemed off, significantly enough to make the hairs at the back of my neck stand. I shrugged it off initially, attributing it to the unusually harsh winter that year. I continued my path, the skis slicing through the thick blanket of snow, my breath appearing as small clouds before me. While I was lost in the rhythm, a sudden whiff of something strange caught me off guard. It was a mix of different odors, wet dog, the nauseating smell of garbage, and something else that I could not quite point out. Ignoring this odd change in scenery, I proceeded on my path. The skies were gradually turning from orange to blue, and the vast white wilderness had an ethereal glow. The feeling of unease was growing inside me like a gnawing pit in my stomach, contrasting sharply with the calm solitude of the landscape. All the while, the stench kept getting stronger, a fetid mix of rotting meat and a tinge of something like sulfur. It was so strong that I had to stop to gather myself. I looked around me, hoping to spot an animal carcass, anything to explain the smell. A sudden deep guttural sound made me snap my head around. The noise was animalistic, a growl that seemed to boom in the desolate silence of the wilderness. I strained my eyes to peer into the snow clouds that my skis had just kicked up. A sense of foreboding overtook me, the deafening silence serving as a harsh reminder that I was indeed, very much alone, and what happened next was insane. I remember seeing a sudden movement from the corner of my eye. There was a figure that was definitely not human, 
standing where no living creature should be. Its silhouette was curiously off, as if it wasn't supposed to be there, yet it was. I squinted trying to make out the obscurity, but it ducked behind a cluster of trees. I could see it pacing. Its predatory gait sent a fresh wave of chill creeping over me. Then the movement stopped, and I realized that it was observing me. Curiosity warred with fear in my mind as I let my eyes fixate on the place. I saw it emerge, almost reluctantly, its figure unclear against the snowy background. It was massive, towering at about nine feet. There was a hump on its back that I couldn't understand. The creature had a dark coat that was a mixed meld of black and browns and a mane around its neck that flowed down like a cloak. It stood upright, standing on its hind legs, which were eerily similar to human legs. But these were muscular, bulkier, and clearly powerful. Its face was demonic, a twisted version of a hyena's that housed a double row of teeth in its grotesquely long snout. The eyes gleamed. A low primal growl rumbled out from it, echoing ominously in the silent, wintry air. That was my breaking point, the sight, smell, and sound sinking together in a horrifying reality. I will never forget the surge of adrenaline that engulfed me. I turned on my heel, a frantic energy bubbling inside me, and took off at a pace I didn't know I was capable of. I could hear the sounds of my frantic heartbeat resonating in the haunting silence. I never looked back, not until I had crossed the threshold of my house, the safety of solid walls barricading me from the wilderness and its inhabitants. The memory of that encounter out there in the wilderness still lingers with me to this day. It is a haunting reminder of the reality we often ignore. The peace and serenity I once found in my skiing escapades have now been stained with this gruesome encounter. Every time I set foot in the snow or feel the winter air seeping into my skin, I'm reminded of that eerie sensation and those hypnotic eyes watching me from afar. It's been years now, but every time I recall the incident, it unfurls in me a dread so cold and deep that it never fails to send shivers down my spine. I later was told that what I encountered was known as Dogman, but I'm not sure because I don't know enough about them. They said it is a creature from the twilight zone of humanity that continues to lurk in the shadows of our awareness. What do you think? I had the distinct pleasure of staying in this idyllic cabin in the wilds of Michigan for my last vacation. It was something I had been planning for a while. The cabin was a hidden gem, nestled between towering pines, with a gorgeous view of the nearby lake. Perfect place to be in the dead middle of nowhere, if you like that kind of thing. And I did. Now I had heard a bit about this place before I arrived, mostly about the numerous hiking trails and fishing spots. But there was one other thing. There was an urban legend of a creature known as the Dogman, who was said to live somewhere in the wilderness nearby. Now, I never believed in things like that, and if I'm being totally honest, I thought it was a bit ridiculous. Famous last words and all that. On the day of my arrival, the woods around me felt unnaturally quiet. Easily explainable, though. Now, the woods are never really quiet if you take a moment to listen. You'll hear chirping birds, squirrels, chipmunks, all sorts of little creatures scurrying about. When the woods are quiet, that's when you have to worry. That means there's a predator in the area. However, a lot of these little forest critters think humans are predators. The animals here aren't like the ones in the city that come right up to you looking for a snack. These ones are wild. They think you are a danger, and they clear out as soon as they see or smell you. So, given how isolated the cabin was, I wasn't surprised that all the wildlife ran for cover the minute I showed up. I got there and took my time unpacking and exploring my surroundings. Beyond the cabin grounds, it was eternal green. Forgotten trails led me deep into the woodland, and in the distance, a brook bubbled up from the ground. I did a bit of hiking that first day and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. The woods were still quiet, but I figured the locals just weren't used to me yet. That night, I started to notice a putrid, acrid smell hanging around the cabin. At first, I dismissed it as the scent of the wild, maybe a skunk or something decaying in the woods. But this smell was different. It was a more unnatural and revolting stench. 
quite unlike anything I'd ever experienced. I tried to shake it off. I started a fire in the wood stove, hoping that maybe the scent of the wood smoke would suffocate the strange stench. And it did a little, but it was still there in the end. That smell hung around for the next few days. It was strange, but even stranger, I thought, was that I hadn't seen one wild animal since I arrived. Not one squirrel, not even a bird. That was unusual and frankly concerning. I was just starting to think about cutting my trip short. I just couldn't shake that feeling that something wasn't right. My suspicions were confirmed later that night as I was getting into bed. Out of nowhere, I heard this deep howl outside my cabin. It didn't sound like a coyote or even a wolf. It was a deeper, more melancholy sound. I dashed to the window, but all I saw were the murky woods. I ended up going into town the next day to chat with some of the locals. I sat down at the one bar and grill in town and found some people to talk to on their lunch break. I mentioned the strange smell around the cabin, the lack of wildlife and the strangely deep howl. I was told that wolves weren't common in the area, but there seems like there was something else they weren't telling me. I ended up heading back to the cabin with more questions than answers. I decided I would go talk to the man who rented me the cabin later that night, Mr. Todd. He lived a few miles down the road on the adjoining property. He was a bit of an odd duck when I met him the first time. I don't think he was terribly well liked around town. I ended up swinging by around dusk, unsure of if he had a day job or not. He was on his porch when I pulled in, but it was like he didn't even notice me. He was standing at the edge of the porch, facing the forest, like he was intently watching something. When I reached him, I couldn't help but notice his odd silhouette. He seemed different than when I had seen him before. He had this unusually muscular and hunched stature. His back seemed broader than I had remembered it. He sniffed the air like a dog and then turned around to face me. His eyes were not his own. They were this golden amber color. They were like a wolf's eyes. He looked completely feral. It took him a moment to register who I was, like he was coming out of a trance or something. His eyes flashed to brown again and he screamed at me. He told me to get out, get out now, and don't come back until morning. I don't think I was quite able to comprehend what was taking place, but I got in my truck and squealed out of there as fast as I could. I locked myself in the cabin that night. I heard the creature howling outside, but it didn't approach the cabin. My mind was racing. Could Mr. Todd be? No, that was impossible. I can't even bring myself to write out my thoughts. It just couldn't be. I had to see Mr. Todd again when I dropped off the keys to the cabin. He seemed normal then, and we didn't talk at all about that night that I stopped in. The night he had those yellow eyes. I still can't believe my own story, or the possibility that Mr. Todd isn't quite human, and the thought that there might be others out there like him. It's a bit too much to think about for me. I have a story from my time as a state police officer in northwestern Montana. There were a few odd situations over the years, but nothing compares to this. I was sent out to a rural homestead to investigate a complaint of property damage and potential theft. The homestead was an off-grid cabin about as deep in the mountains as you could get while still having access to a halfway decent road in the winter to make it to and from town. The couple that lived there were odd, to say the least. They were mostly self-sustainable out there. They raised a few farm animals and grew a lot of their own food and stored it over the winter in a root cellar. It was nearing the end of fall and most of the mountain roads were closed for the winter. The drive up to the cabin was a little hairy, but I made it okay. When I arrived, the only thing I knew was that something happened involving the root cellar, but I waited for them to tell me their story. And it was quite the story at that. It began last summer. They noticed food going missing from their garden. They figured it was the local wildlife and installed a fence around the garden, but food continued to disappear. The garden was done for the season, but I checked the fence. It was eight feet tall and there were no signs of animals getting through or under the fence. The only way into the garden was through a gate and the couple both said they never once found the gate unlatched. They installed a mess cover on top of the fence to prevent any birds or animals that could climb the fence. 
There was truly nowhere that an animal could get through this fence. Now, wildlife eating through people's gardens is definitely a problem out here, but it wasn't something you'd call the police for. After harvesting the garden and moving everything into the root cellar, someone or something began breaking in and stealing food from there. And here is where it gets weird. There were no signs of any animals, no prints, no scat. The door to the root cellar was not damaged in any way, but there was a significant amount of things missing. They told me that pretty much everything in there was stored in various sizes of mason jars. The entire jars were missing. Nothing was knocked on the ground, just vanished. If the food thief was an animal of some sort, we'd expect to see jars on the ground and things damaged or broken in the cellar, but there was none of that. The man just looked at me. I could tell he wanted to speak, but something stopped him. I told him to go ahead, that I've probably heard stranger theories. He told me he had been watching the root cellar through the window every night for the past two weeks, and he finally saw the culprit. He said it was a human, but it wasn't a normal human. He didn't know whether to call the police or fish and wildlife. I asked him to elaborate, and he said he saw the thief heading to the cellar just after dark, and it was definitely a person. The lack of outside lights made it difficult to see, but he went outside to confront the suspected food thief and scare him off. He met him coming out of the cellar carrying a leather bag full of mason jars. The man said he was human, but he wasn't human like we were. He had a large brow ridge and deep-set eyes. His face and body were square-shaped, and he was only maybe five feet tall. He was wearing boots and clothes that appeared to be made from fur and animal hide. The man said it was like looking at some prehistoric history book. He yelled at the thief and it took off running towards the forest, but before it did, it reached into its bag and tried to hand the man something. He didn't take it, but the person or creature or whatever dropped it on the ground and ran. He followed the thief to the edge of the forest, but it was too dark to try to track whatever it was. He went back to inspect the root cellar and see what all had been taken. It was at that moment that he looked on the ground for what the creature tried to offer him. There were arrowheads, spear points, and a couple of other stone tools. I had absolutely no idea what to do about this case. I took the arrowheads for evidence, but I didn't have anything else to go on. We couldn't find a trail in the forest to even attempt to track the creature. I was straight with the couple. I told them there wasn't much I could do here. They asked if anyone else in the area had been seeing these people. The man was convinced that there are, I don't know how to say it without sounding crazy, but cave people living out in the mountains completely isolated from the rest of society. He said he wasn't sure if they were a separate species of human or not, but that they could be the cause for all the Bigfoot stories in the area. I can't say if I believed him or not. I never saw the creature. I did, however, follow up with the couple in the spring of the year. They were both out working in the garden when I arrived and had expanded it quite a bit. And strangely, they said they weren't having any problems anymore. On my way back to my vehicle, I glanced at the root cellar. The door had a display of arrowheads along the top that wasn't there last fall. I didn't ask any more questions. Looking back, I wished I had, but at the same time, I don't think I was ready to know what exactly lives out there in the mountains. Here's my strange encounter. This all happened when I was just a teenager. I don't remember the exact year, but it would have been back in the mid-2000s. I was in high school at the time. There wasn't ever much going on in the little Pennsylvanian town I called home, but every place has its ghost stories, and that's often how we would keep ourselves entertained. There was this huge, ancient-looking building on the outskirts of town, an old, abandoned asylum that everyone said was seriously haunted. Of course, as kids found its mystery absolutely irresistible. Exploring that place had become a sort of rite of passage among us. It was one of those, I dare you to go in type things. By the time I got there, I'd heard all kinds of stories about orbs of light, strange childlike whispers, and stuff moving around on its own. I always dismissed it as just tales made up to scare the younger kids. The asylum stood like a rotten tooth in a desolate part of town. Overgrown foliage was starting to take over the building, like the earth was trying to pull it underground. It was an old Victorian-era relic, antiquated and imposing, 
with its weather-worn bricks and ornate architecture. I imagine it would have been quite the sight in its heyday. It was an asylum, yes, but it was built like a massive apartment building. I could tell the original builders had tried to make it appear welcoming, but in its state of decay, it was anything but. I found myself standing before its rusted iron gates. In my backpack, I'd packed a flashlight, a water bottle, and a Polaroid camera. I had heard one too many stories about the place, and I was going to see for myself what it was all about. Stepping past those cold iron gates, I remember feeling this weird sensation. There was a weird vibration in the air, like there was an electrical energy in the place. I hopped over the few fallen beams at the entrance and squeezed myself through the wooden boards that had been nailed across the main doorway, presumably to keep us kids out. Inside, the smell of decades-old dust and decay hit me out of nowhere. I began exploring, room after room, my flashlight cutting through the shadows, and my camera capturing snapshots of the interior of the structure. Some rooms, probably the ones that served as bedrooms, still had the iron bed frames in place. I was snapping photos in the dim light when I heard a strange sound. It was like someone was scratching on the wall. My heart instantly started racing. I pointed my flashlight at the area where I thought the sound originated, but I couldn't see anything. I thought maybe it was an animal that had taken shelter inside, but then I heard a whisper. I couldn't make out what it was saying, but it was definitely a voice. I wasn't alone anymore. A gust of cold wind inexplicably swept past me. My flashlight flicked across the room, shadow and light dancing on the peeling wallpapers. In my scan of the room, I saw it. There was a wispy, human-shaped figure in the corner of the room. Their form shifted in the beam of my flashlight, like the person was made of smoke. I stood there completely frozen like an idiot. I don't think I could have ran if I wanted to. It was like my shoes were stuck in cement. I couldn't move at all. The strange form drifted closer, diffusing through the floating dust particles. Despite my mounting dread, curiosity got the best of me. I brought the camera up to my face and clicked the button. The Polaroid spat out an image. I didn't have the chance to look at it in that moment. My mind was on the figure in front of me. The apparition wafted closer, passing through solid barriers. Veins of cold seemed to web out from it. I could see the cold in the air. It looked like ice cracking on a lake. I felt an instinctive shiver pass violently through me. My eyes were glued to the being's face. There weren't any features that I could make out, but a voice escaped its lips. Help me. It trembled in a shaky voice. The words struck me like a bolt of lightning, snapping me back into my senses, and I reacted less bravely than I'd like to admit. Panic spurred me to frantically backpedal. I could feel my heart in my throat and a knot in my guts. Ignoring the startled yelp that escaped my lips, I shot out of the room. The flashlight's beam wildly darted across the hallways in my frantic dash. I vaulted over the rubble and burst through the front entrance. I looked back at the building, but I didn't see any signs of the apparition inside. I went home and tried to forget about the events of the night, but I couldn't. I wished I had reacted differently that I had stopped to ask the being what help it needed. Maybe it was trapped there and needed someone to help it move on. It took me a good long while, but I did end up going back to the asylum. But the ghost I had met that night was nowhere to be found. I think I will forever wonder what became of it. I like to think it was able to find peace in whatever manner that might be. As for me, looking back on it, it awakened my belief in the paranormal, but most importantly, I don't fear it. My ghost story isn't one of terror and fright, though I certainly was at the time. The ghost I encountered did not want to hurt anyone. It just wanted to be released from its bonds to our world. I hope maybe this will give solace to some of you out there who are afraid of things that go bump in the night.